Welcome to worship. We're so glad you're here with us today. My name is Sheila and I'll be your host for this online worship experience. If this is your first time with us today, we wanna give you a very special welcome. We invite you to check in with us and give us your name and an email address. And this coming week, we will forward a coupon for free coffee on us. We hope you'll join us again. This is the final week in our sermon series, The Truth About Lies. Pastor Spencer has a great message just ahead for all of us. And speaking of the message, you'll find sermon discussion questions and more online at schweitzer.church slash next. And now, here's Corey with our announcements. Hello, welcome to Schweitzer Church. I'm Corey Lucivo, Director of Groups and Classes. It's hard to believe, but this week is the beginning of Lent, and this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. At 6.30 p.m., we will have a special Ash Wednesday service with a night of worship led by our modern worship team. We are inviting kids, students, and all adults to be a part of this special service. Childcare will be provided for pre-K and under, and if you're in a group of any kind on Wednesday nights, we want you to join us for this special Wednesday night service. During Lent, we will also have some new classes starting up. Bob Cassidy will lead a study called Follow the Healer beginning next Sunday, February 18th at 5 p.m. downstairs in Memorial Hall. On Wednesday nights, beginning February 21st, Pastor Jason will lead a seven-week book discussion called Meaningful Work, which will help you answer the question, how could work feed my soul? Pick up a book and sign up for either class today in the Fellowship Center or on the Church Center app. Ladies, today is the day to sign up for the Heart to Heart Gathering coming up this Saturday from 9 to 11 a.m. We'll have an amazing breakfast charcuterie board and spend time talking about how to have hope when circumstances are hard. You can sign up today at the Blue Booth or by going to schweitzer.church heart. One last thing, there's always a lot happening at Schweitzer and we would love to help you get connected. One great way to learn more is by being a part of our Next Steps Lunch next Sunday at 11.45 a.m. right outside in the Fellowship Center. This is a great way to learn more about our church, get to know our pastors, and even get a tour of the church campus. You can sign up today at the Blue Booth or on the Church Center app. Once again, thank you so much for being here. Now, let's continue in worship. Thanks, Corey, for those great announcements. I want to remind you that you can join us for any or all of these wonderful things that are happening at Schweitzer Church. You can find out more information online at schweitzer.church next. If you're joining us live today, I want to invite you to join in the chat. Say hello to your friends or give us your insights. And if you find yourself in need of prayer, we have someone waiting for you right now in the prayer room. Just press that button and we'll be right with you. And now, let's continue in worship. There is no fear, cause I believe. There is no doubt, cause I have seen. Faithfulness, my fortress, over and over. I have a hope found in your name. I have a strength found in your grace. Your faithfulness, my fortress. Over and over Make way through the waters Walk me through the fire Do what you are famous for What you are famous for Shut the mouths of lions Bring dry bones to life And do what you are famous for What you are famous for I believe your love inside of me 
Release your power for all to see. Spirit, come and fall on us over and over. Oh, make way through the waters. Walk me through the fire. Do what you are famous for. What you are famous for. Shut the mouths of lions. Bring troubles to nothing. Do what you are Think, Lord, you will never fail. Your name is powerful, your words unstoppable. All things are possible in you. God of exceedingly, God of abundantly, more than we ask or think. Lord, you will never fail. Your name is powerful. Your words unstoppable, all things are possible. Yeah, yeah. Make way through the waters, walk me through the fire. Do what you are famous for, you are famous for. Shut the mouths of lions, bring troubles to nothing. Do what you are famous for, what you are famous for. Strength found in your grace, your faithfulness, my fortress over and over. As we come to this special time in our service, I want to introduce you to my good friend Stephanie Taylor. Stephanie is our Kids Ministry Director here at Schweitzer, and she's going to tell you what's going on with our kids right now. Hi, I'm Stephanie, the Director of Kids Ministry with a focus on kindergarten through sixth grade spiritual formation, and some exciting things have been happening in kids. The past five weeks, we have done a series called Playlist where we focused on what kids may think about themselves, some worries they may have, thoughts like I'm not smart enough or I'm not fast enough or I'm just not enough. Well, we have taken these words and these thoughts and we have turned to scripture where we have found the truth in who God says we are. These kids have learned that they are loved, they are chosen, they are worthy and it's such amazing things have been happening and I'm so excited to see these truths that they have found in scripture play out as we work on our series coming up focused on Lent. Stephanie, thanks for letting us know what's going on with kids' ministry right now. We are so thankful for Stephanie's leadership and for our wonderful ministry with children. But today is a special day for another great reason. Today, Stephanie is taking the next step in God's call for her life. She has been approved by the Board of Ordained Ministry as a ministerial candidate here at Schweitzer Church. Stephanie, it's my joy to present you with a certificate and to encourage you as you continue your call from God in your life. I'd like to take a moment to pray over Stephanie. Holy God, I thank you for Stephanie Taylor. I thank you for the joy that she brings to ministry and for her willingness to listen to your word and to heed your call. God, as she continues to follow your leading, I ask you to bless her continue to give her this amazing enthusiasm that has been such a joy to all of us and help her to hear your calling for her life. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. And now let's focus in on Pastor Spencer as he leads us in our final week of the series, The Truth About Lies.
Well, welcome today. My name is Spencer. I'm so glad that you've joined us today. Uh, this is part six of our, of our series, The Truth About Lies. This is the last week in this series. Next week, we start our, our period of the year called Lent. It starts on Ash Wednesday, which is this coming Wednesday. And uh, Lent is this period of, of, of the year that leads to Easter. And we're going to spend that those six weeks leading up to Easter looking at the very last week of Jesus. It starts with his triumphal entry. It ends with his crucifixion. And every day in that series or every week in that series, we're just going to lift up one of those days and walk through that incredibly important last week of Jesus. I promise you it is going to be rich and full and you will want to be a part of that. Uh, today, as we end the series, The Truth About Lies, part six of six, if you haven't been with us, Here is the premise of our series. There is a battle within each of us and all of us collectively for truth. We see this battle every single day. People talk about situational ethics, moral relativism. You watch the news, misinformation, disinformation, alternative facts. You hear platitudes like live your truth and you gotta be true to yourself. You you have this this, uh, way that we live now. People talk, we live in a post-truth world. And yet as Christians, we believe that truth is given to us by God, revealed in his son, Jesus. He himself is the way, the truth, and the life. And so this battle for truth is not just a battle of ideas. We believe it's spiritual in nature. And what we see in the Bible is that there is a deceiver. It goes by many titles, the devil, the Satan, the tempter. But he actively seeks to deceive us and lead us away from God's truth. And we see this deception from the very beginning of the Bible. So Genesis chapter 3, here's what we read about his deception from the very, very beginning. It goes like this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals <clears throat> the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat uh, from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you'll die. (laughs) You'll not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, each week in the series, we have started here in Genesis 3 because this is a pivotal moment in the Bible. If you're not familiar with the Bible, before Genesis 3, life is perfect. It's the Garden of Eden. Everything is as God had intended it to be. After Genesis 3 is all of the death and destruction and dysfunction and sin that we see in the world today. And the hinge point here is Genesis 3. It's this rebellion against what God has commanded and taught. And as you trace it down, what you see at the, at the root of this rebellion is deception. And so in this series, what we're doing is simply lifting up these deceptive phrases that the snake says every single week and, and looking through them and unpacking them. And as we do, what we find are some common and predictable deceptions that really honestly plague all of us. And so today, it's the last week of the series, we come to the last phrase that the snake says to the woman, and as he, as he promises her that, that if, that if they eat of the fruit, they'll become like God. And then there comes this phrase that you'll, you'll become like God, knowing good and evil, knowing good and evil. Now that phrase, knowing good and evil is obviously tied to the temptation, right? Because the temptation is to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So now that we're at the final week of this series, let's finally address that temptation to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What was that all about? Now, we meet the tree of knowledge of good and evil in Genesis chapter two. So if you go back one chapter, um, this is how we meet that tree. First, we're introduced to it. Verse eight says, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed because the woman had not yet been created. So just the man. And the Lord God brought all kinds of, or it made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. And then listen to this next phrase, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Now, if you remember what we read earlier in Genesis 3, the next chapter, the temptation, well, the exact same phrase is used, but with an addition. So Genesis 3 verse 6 said it like this, the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. Same exact phrase as Genesis 2, but then adds this line, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. So So in Eve's mind, this temptation to eat of the tree is not just about some tasty treat. There there is something here that is good for gaining wisdom. In other words, there's something enticing about this tree 
that will help her navigate the world. It's tied to how I see the world and, and therefore it's also tied to how I see myself in the world. So there's the tree that's there. Skip down to verse 15, uh, chapter 2. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. So in the Garden of Eden are these I guess lots of trees, but two in particular. You have the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And on the surface, this command to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil seems just really strange. It makes very little sense, doesn't it? I mean, why would God want to keep Adam and Eve from eating the knowledge, uh, for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why, why would God want to keep that from them? Like, like, why would God want to limit our knowledge of good and evil? Wouldn't God want us to be discerning of what is good and what is evil? So it makes very little sense. Um, biblical scholar Sandra Richter writes in her incredible book, uh, The Epic of Eden. I highly recommend it. She writes this. On the surface, this seems like a simple, even silly rule. But in reality, this one edict encompasses the singular law of Eden. God is God and we are not. That's so important. God is God and we are not. She goes on. If humanity would simply acknowledge the innate authority of the Creator and recognize that they were tenants and stewards in God's garden, they would live in paradise forever. But if they had to have access to every part of the garden, if they had to be free to choose their own rules and decide for themselves what is good and evil, if they had to be autonomous of the authority of the great king, then they would die. So the one edict of Eden, the singular law of Eden, God is God and we are not. Therefore, God is the one who gets to name. He is the one who gets to decide what is good and what is evil. Now, later in the same book, uh, Richter decides, describes this decision that uh, Adam and Eve have to make like this. She says, she says, Adam and Eve have to decide, do they want to live in the world as God has made it? Or do they want to live in the world as they can make it? And so the temptation of that tree to eat of this tree of knowledge of good and evil is not just a simple, silly rule, but really what is at the heart of this is to take that authority upon ourselves of deciding what is good and what is evil, and it's to take that authority away from God and to give it to ourselves. So, so everything with this temptation, it, it hinges on this one edict of Eden, that God is God and we are not. And, and because this is a, a, a common and predictable um, deception to, re, to reject this, we, we should really spend some time drilling down on this. Like, like, like this one edict of Eden, God is God and we are not, is is obviously tied to the creation story because this is who God is, that he is God because he created all things. And so let's, let's, let's think about this a little bit more. Let's drill down on this because, because this is such an important law, such an important rule that God is God and we are not. Let's drill down on this a little bit more. And it's obviously tied to the creation. So let's go to Genesis chapter one and let's just read the very first um, verse of the Bible and drill down on this a little bit more to consider how is it and why is it important that God is God and we are not. So Genesis one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? This is why there's only that one edict of Eden. God is God and we are not. It's because of Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, a lot of times when we read Genesis 1, we rush right past this. We, we go right past verse 1 to all the good stuff, the seven days of creation, the interesting things, you know, what God said, let there be light, all those kinds of things. But let's not rush past this because understanding this first verse in the Bible is paramount, to how you live your life. How you think about this first verse in the Bible, it will shape how do you decide what's important in life. How you think about this first verse in the Bible, it will shape how do you handle the decisions that you make in your life. How do you see yourself in the world? All of these kinds of things, big questions of life come down to this very first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, so to, to, 
to wrestle with this, let's ask a, a fun question, maybe a question you never really asked yourself before when it comes to this very first verse in the Bible. But here's a fun question to ask um, about this first verse. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, why? Why did God create the heavens and the earth? Have you ever thought about that before? Why would God do this? Why, what motivated God to create the heavens and the earth and, and to do this? And so let's just think about that. Why? A Christian um, philosopher and and theologian, Christopher Watkin, he takes up this question and he writes this. I'm going to read this slowly. This is kind of dense, but I I just think it's so rich and uh, answers this question of why in such a profoundly compelling way. But listen to this. God did not create because he had to. God did not make the universe to satisfy something that was incomplete in him. He does not need the universe in order to be who he is, and he does not need us in order to be fulfilled. God already owns all of our treasure, all our time, all our talent, and our very selves. There is nothing we can add to him, no way in which we can make him greater than he already is. We are in every way dependent on him. He is no way, in no way dependent on us. And then he writes this, neither we nor the universe are necessary. (laughs) So welcome to church. (laughs) Now, some of us hear that and we probably push back a little bit. I mean, you would think to ourselves, well, that is a cold reading of Genesis 1, that we are not necessary. How can you say I'm not necessary? My mom told me I was special. How can you say I'm not necessary? So we might push back on this and for a couple of reasons. I think we push back on this for one, because, because for us to say that, that, that God is complete in and of himself and therefore didn't have to make anything, including us, well, well that means that God is in the center of everything. And I hate to tell you this, but if God is in the center of everything, then that means you are not. And so we push back on that because I want to be at the center of everything. And two, we push back on this because as soon as God is rightly placed at the center of everything, then we lose control because we are no longer at the center of everything. And if God created all things and he didn't need to, well, then our purpose and approach to life fundamentally changes. So back to Watkin, he, he puts an application around this, this idea. What does this mean for our purpose and approach to life if we are unnecessary? So he keeps writing. And again, I'm going to read this slow because it's dense. But here's what he writes next. The core of the doctrine of creation is not the fact that the world came into existence, but that it did not need to. This means that we adopt the posture of recipients. We receive existence, right? We don't make existence. We receive existence. We receive meaning, right? We don't create our own meaning. We receive meaning. And we receive love. We don't deserve love. We receive love. He writes, the one thing we should not do with a gift is to pretend we bought or made it ourselves. The giver is usually thanked. So our fundamental orientation to existence is one of praise and thanksgiving. So when we say that the singular law of Eden is that God is God and we are not, this means that we live in God's world. Therefore, this is not our world. This means that God is at the center of everything. This means that we are not. This means that that our lives fit into God's plans and God does not fit into our plans. This means that God gets to decide what is good and what is evil, and therefore we submit to him and his revelation. And this means that God gets to call the shots and that we therefore conform to God's will. God does not conform to us, but rather we conform to him. And honestly, Not very many people understand this truth. So about a year ago, I started to spend some time uh, thinking about deception, and this is what led to this sermon series. I I spent some time thinking about this, and 
And what spurred um, me to start thinking about deception is that somehow or other, I don't remember how I came across this, but I, I came across this academic article written by a, you know, a Bible professor about uh, Genesis chapter three, this, this famous passage we've been reading each week in the series. And, and the article is written by this Bible professor at some university. I don't remember who it was. And I don't remember how I found it, but, but I, I was, I was reading this, this article and, and uh, academic, you know, kind of article. And the professor was arguing that we get Genesis chapter three all wrong. Right, so the traditional way of reading Genesis 3, which is how we teach it here, is that um, Adam and Eve are deceived. They, uh, in their deception, rebel against God, which is sin, and in their sin, they reap all kinds of destruction um, in the world that we still see today. This is, you know, traditional reading of Genesis 3, but this professor's are arguing, no, 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 no. We need, we need to pump the brakes on that. We don't need to see Eve like that as the perpetrator of sin. Rather, we should see Eve as the hero of the story. Because after all, it's through Eve's bravery that we see somebody who decided to, to own her own voice. <laughs> it's, it's Eve that, that, uh, that she, she's able to recognize her desires and, and to chart her own course and decide who she was going to be. And she decided to live her truth and find her own way and follow her own heart. And she decided to do all of this and overcome the patriarchy of the Garden of Eden, where she had to live in her God's authority alongside her husband. And I read this article and my response was, I like literally my jaw dropped. I'm like, what? <laughs> what a crazy way to read Genesis 3. But then as I did some more research, I was shocked by how common that kind of reading of Genesis 3 was becoming. And in retrospect, I don't know why I was surprised by that, because after all, that kind of reading of Genesis 3 is simply reflecting the values of our secular modern life that we all see every day. I mean, the, the, the dominant idea in our secular post-Christian Western culture is that the most important thing in life is personal happiness. We see this all the time. I mean, this is why you have those platitudes, like you just have to be true to yourself and live your authentic self or live your truth or this great one, follow your heart, which is a great advice if you just want to wreck your life. But this is how so many people choose to live their life. I mean, this is how we determine what's important in life is, is in what's going to make us happy is, is we think about that. What's important in life? What values are you going to have is, is what makes me happy? You know, I think about the career advice we give to young people sometimes who are wondering, what should I do with my life? And sometimes we say to them, well, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you're happy. Or, or I think about when life gets difficult, maybe especially in a relationship like a, like a marriage and we're no longer happy. You know, what do we do about it? Or I think about how when people have to make a decision in life, how often is the advice that's given by their well-intended friend something to the effect of, you know, you just got to be true to yourself, just follow your heart. You know, you, you won't go wrong if you do that. Like this is Adam and Eve. They fall for this common and predictable deception that that they can decide for themselves how they want to live their life. They can decide for themselves what's best for them according to their own understanding. And so therefore they reject this one law, the singular edict of Eden, that God is God and we are not. That he is the creator and we are the creation. That he is at the center and we are not. That he gets to decide how life is to be lived and therefore, the best life is the one that's lived in submission and obedience to him. Now, as I think about this scene in the Garden of Eden, where you got Adam and Eve deciding to go their own way, um, deciding for themselves that they're going to live their life, deciding for themselves what's good and evil, and above all else, deciding to reject the authority of God over their life and the world, I can't help but think of another time in the Bible where someone was also wrestling with the will of God, and this person was, was wrestling with the authority of God over their life and over the world and what that meant. And I, and I can't help but notice how this other time in the Bible that comes to mind, this person is wrestling with the will of God and they're, they're wrestling with it also in a garden. But this other time in the, in the garden that I, that I can't help but think of, you know, is, is not the rejection of God's authority like we see with Adam and Eve and the embrace of personal autonomy, but rather this other time in the garden, we see submission to God's will and authority over them. And it's a submission and obedience that even to the point of suffering that we find that leads to all kinds of blessing on the other side. This other time in the garden that I'm thinking of is in Matthew chapter 26. Jesus, on the night that he's arrested, 
he goes with his disciples to a garden. And while he's there, he pulls Peter and James and John aside. And he has a conversation with them before he goes to pray. And this is what he says to them. This is verse 38. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Now just hear that turmoil that Jesus is facing. This is not an easy thing that he's about to face. This is not an enjoyable thing. I mean, he's going to be arrested. He's going to be uh, falsely accused. He's going to be wrongly tried. He's going to be beaten and crucified. This is the path that he's on. And so sometimes we think that to be obedient to God uh, means that life is going to go great. That's why we choose obedience is because there's blessing on the other side of that. But, but sometimes obedience requires suffering. And this is where Jesus is at. So verse 39, going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. He's like, listen, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't, I don't want to go down this path. This is not what's going to make me happy. This is, this is painful. This path is difficult. But then he says this, yet not as I will, but as you will. Verse 40, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you keep watch? Couldn't you men keep watch? With me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you may not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 42, he went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, he then says this last line, May your will be done. Now that last line, May your will be done. In the original Greek, that line is word for word, the exact same thing that we read in the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done. So when Jesus is at the crossroads in the garden, he does the exact opposite of what Adam and Eve do also in their own garden. So when faced with the point of decision, Adam and Eve take matters into their own hands they make life about themselves. They choose to put themselves in the center. They free themselves from God's constraints in order to live a life as they see it according to their terms. And the result is all of the destruction that we see in the world today. Jesus, also in a garden, when he faces the difficulty of obedience, in this case, extreme suffering, Jesus puts himself in his father's hands. He entrusts himself to his father's care. And, and it would be very, very easy, very, very tempting for Jesus to go the other way, take the path of Adam and Eve here, to reject the imminent suffering, to reject the, pa the path Father has for him. But instead, Jesus submits to the Father's will and that simple line, they will be done. And the result of Jesus' submission and obedience to the Father's will is the salvation for all who trust in him. The one edict of Eden, God is God and we are not. Therefore, God and God alone has the authority to name what is good. God and God alone has the authority to decide this all by himself. And so you see, there's a common and predictable deception that I can be the one to decide for myself how my life should be lived. It's a common and predictable deception to put my own happiness and well-being first. It's a common and predictable deception to decide to reject God's authority, especially when following God's will is difficult and requires sacrifice. And it's a common and predictable deception to forget that he is the creator and we are not. And that dynamic can never change. And so as we said throughout this series, you know, deception is easy to see in other people. It's so hard to see in ourselves. And so, um, and as we think about this deception and try to recognize in ourselves, one of the most helpful things to realize is that, you know, deception leads to destruction and dysfunction and sin. And so as you start to think about these questions of, of deception, you know, the question we ask ourselves is not, am I deceived, but how am I deceived? And, and we start to see our deception as it begins to live out in the fruit of our lives and the fruit of the destruction and dysfunction and sin of our lives. And so as we look into our lives, especially the places that are broken, maybe we think about where there are places where there's continual conflict without reconciliation and forgiveness or Maybe we think about where there is sin that we keep struggling with, or maybe we think about places where there's just fear and worry that runs rampant in our minds and our hearts or some other dysfunction or destruction. You know, the question we should be asking ourselves is this, am I struggling in this area because I've come to believe a lie? A lie about myself, a lie about God, a lie about the world. And maybe, just maybe, 
the lie that I've come to believe is that I can run my life on my own terms, that I can decide for myself what is right and wrong, what is good and what is evil, that I can put myself in the center of all things, that I can put my own personal happiness and well-being first and foremost. And so I decide for myself how I'm gonna live. I set my priorities, I set my values, I set what feels good for me, and, and I begin to live the reverse of the edict of Eden. Because the one law of Eden that does not change is that God is God and that I am not. And when I get that confused and I begin to invert that, or I begin to put myself in the place of God's authority, destruction is always what follows. Let's pray. And so fathers, we um, wrap up the series. We think about this power of deception that is so at work in so many of our lives. Here's another common and predictable deception we need to wrestle with. Are there places in our life where we have rejected your authority? Places in our life where we have put our own personal happiness first and foremost. Places in our life where we have decided to put ourselves in the center of all things instead of looking to you. Places in our lives where we have rejected your authority and instead chosen the easy path. Would you speak to us and challenge us and reveal to us the truth that you are God and we are not. You are the creator. We are the creation. You are the one who gets to decide. And so instead of living our lives like Adam and Eve, who put themselves in the center, who put them, make lives about them and what they want and what's happy and comfortable for them, instead may we live like Jesus, who even when faced with suffering says, may your will be done. May my life reflect your will. May I reflect your authority. May I reflect your purpose. May I reflect what it is that you want to be done on earth. And so Father, may we live as these kinds of folks, these kinds of people who are set and centered on the authority of God, lived in obedience to him, because this is how you've created us. You are God and we are not. We submit ourselves to you. For anyone who's with us, who, who doesn't know the, the power of Jesus in our lives to change us, to free us, to give us a new path, we just simply offer up a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, would you forgive me my sin and would you lead my life? We thank you for your love and mercy that always reaches out to us, that we can always find a way and a path home to you. It is in your name that we pray today. Amen. Thank you so much for being here with us today for worship. I wanna thank the team that made this service possible and in particular, thank Pastor Spencer for his powerful message. If you know someone who would benefit from this message, I invite you to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That will get the word out and people will be able to hear the word of God in a variety of ways. Thank you so much for doing that. We invite you back next week as we begin our Lenten series, The Last Week. We've got some exciting things planned in the upcoming weeks, and we can't wait for you to be a part of it. Have a great week. Lord, I confess that I've been Stolen your breath And sang my own song And Lord I confess That I'm far from innocent These shackles I wear I bought on my Scarlet sins had a crimson cross You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross An empty slave at the empty grave Thank God that stone was rolled away Lord, I confess Death came to life
Thank God that stone was a rose. 